Well, hello. Welcome to Movement Church Online. I'm Chris. I'm the pastor here at Movement Church, and I'm so glad that you're here today. If you have ever tried to figure out how to figure out the will of God for your life or the plans that God has for your life, today is for you. Today we're in part two of a series called My Will, Thy Will, and today is a fantastic day. Our mission as a church is to lead people in a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, and that's our hope for what happens today. So whether it's your first time or whether you've been a part of us for a long time, part of our church online for a long time, we're so glad that you're here, and we hope that today helps you to take some step closer to Jesus, makes you a better follower of Jesus because of your time with us today. Like I said, today we're in part three, uh, or part two of a series called My Will, Thy Will, where we're talking about how to figure out God's plans and God's will for our lives, how to hear what God might be saying to us, how to follow what God might be showing us, and how to move in the directions where God might be leading us. And so today's a great day to share this online, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube. It's a great day to share this with someone because we feel like this might help someone gain some real clarity on being able to figure out what God might have next for them. So I'd love for you to share this, whether it's on Facebook or, or YouTube. And without any further ado, we're going to jump right in to part two of My Will, Thy Will. Well, we're in the middle of this three-part series talking about the will of God and how to identify God's will for your life. And last week we began with this big, huge statement that God has a plan for your life and you don't want to miss it. That God has a plan and a will for your life and you don't want to miss it for anything or for the world, which is a huge huge idea. And while that's where we started last week, we actually ended off and left off with a really big question, do you want to know God's will really? Like, do you really want to know God's will? Like, we all say we want to know God's will and God's plans for our lives, but we all want to know it. We often don't want to actually do it because there are times in life where God's will for our lives is uncomfortable and inconvenient and costly. And the reason I ask the question, do you want to know it really, is this profound truth that you will be held accountable for what you do with what you know. That you and I, every single one of us, will be held accountable for what you do, for what we do with what we know. So if we know the will and the plans of God for our lives, but we don't do our part to fulfill and accomplish and live toward them, then we will all be held accountable for missing out on what God has for us. And because of that, last week I challenged us that when my will conflicts with thy will, my job and your job is to surrender my will to the will of God. Now, picking up off of that, if it's true that we'll be held accountable for what we do with what we know, how do we know when God is showing us or speaking to us or somehow revealing his will to us? This is a big, this is a big question. If we want to know the will of God, how can we be certain that we're actually hearing from God, sensing his direction, following his leading, and hearing his voice. In other words, how can you tell whether that idea that you had came from God or came from a weird slice of pizza? How can you tell the difference between a good idea and a God idea? Like when I feel like I know what I'm supposed to do and I feel there's a certain way I'm feeling led to do it, how do I know if that's God or if that's me? When I feel like there's specific timing to something, how do I know if that's God's timing or if that's my timing? I mean, when, you, when you've got that sense and that urge, like we've got to start blank how do you know if that's God leading or if that's your own desires? If, if you think, like, I've, we, we've, I've got to stop doing blank. How do you know if that's an urging that comes from yourself or if that's leading that comes from God? Our schedule has to change. How do I know if that's just me feeling too busy and overwhelmed or God telling me that I'm too busy and I need to slow down? If you're feeling like, feeling like you're supposed to break off a relationship, how do you know if that's God's still small voice or your own fear of commitment or your own fear of rejection in a relationship? You have a feeling like you're supposed to make a change in your financial priorities. How do you know if you're hearing from God or if you're hearing that voice of your family's experiences when you were, when you were young and when you were growing up? If it's a you thing, the reason this is important to know, if it's a you thing, you might need to respond and you might need to move in that new direction. But if it's a God thing, 
If it's a God thing, you need to respond correctly and move in that new direction and start that new thing or stop that old thing or change the schedule or break off that relationship or change your financial priorities. Now, let me tell you where this really has come into play for me and for and for our family. When we were in Alamogordo and I was a youth pastor, I felt like God was leading and calling us to move to Las Cruces and to plant a church, th- this one, move, Movement Church. I felt that stirring and calling begin when I was about 27 years old and still a single guy. I was dating Jalen, but we were not yet engaged or, or, or even married. I was like, God, this is what I feel like you are, you're leading me to, but you're going to have to be patient with me because, because I want to be sure that you're behind this and in this, and I want your timing every step of the way. If this is you, I want your way and your timing and your leading every single step of this. And even if this is a good idea, I don't want to plant a church because it's a good idea. I'll only go if this is a God idea. Now, spoiler alert, movement exists today. So I came and we came and we came to the conclusion that this was a God idea, not just a good idea. But in between there, there was a lot of God. You're just not, you're not just leading with the idea. You're leading with the timing and with the plan and with the people. And we want to know for sure that it's you. And if it's not you, we don't want to move a muscle until we know you are telling us us too. So at 27 and single, I pretty quickly understood God wasn't telling me to go start a church right then and right there as a single person in their 20s. Thank God he wasn't telling me that. Uh, I cannot imagine. We didn't start the church until I was 34 and we'd been married for four years. What we've never actually really talked about a whole lot is that our timeline was actually originally about a year earlier than we actually came over, maybe a year and a half. Um, our our originally t- original timeline was to come and start in 2015, but in the middle of 2014, I felt God incredibly clearly speak to me that the timing was not right for two reasons. Number one, I hadn't completed something that I had set out to complete in my job on staff at the church in Alamogordo, not because of a lack of effort, but because it was working. I, I was working. Uh, what I was working on needed more time than I had originally planned on. And two, Jalen and I needed some time to mature and grow as a couple before we jumped into planting a church. And let me just tell you, I am incredibly glad we waited and listened for both of those reasons to to actually complete what we had set out to complete before and for us to have time to grow that that if that when God said this is what you're supposed to do I'm so glad we listened and that we waited at the same time that decision was not an easy an easy one and one we wanted to absolutely make sure we were hearing from God about because we wanted to absolutely be lockstep with God and his plan and with his timing and so the question kind of remains How do you know you're hearing from God and not bad Taco Bell? How do you know you're hearing from God and sensing his direction, not just your own intuition? To start to answer that question, we may actually have to change some of the way that we think about God. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, the changing of our thinking, so that you may discern, so that you can figure out what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Paul draws a distinct connection between the way that we think about God and being able to figure out God's will. He draws a clear line. We have to change our thinking, be the renewing of our mind, and then you'll be able to figure out what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. And I think one of the biggest ways we have to change the way we think is to be aware of what seems like a few contradictions to, as, as we listen for the voice of God. But the voice of God will always have a few things that seem like contradictions. And when we hear them, we sometimes go like, well, that, that both of those can't be true. But when both of these things are true, I think chances are pretty good that we are hearing from God. The first one is that God is quiet but loud. That God is quiet but loud. In 1 Kings 19, um, we, we see the, God speaking to the prophet Elijah. And Elijah is looking for God in the storm. He's looking for God in a fire. He's looking for God in a hurricane, and a whirlwind. But God wasn't in the storm. God wasn't in the fire. God was in the gentle whisper. And at the same time, as God is in the whisper, Elijah had no doubt that he had heard clearly from God. God was quiet, but God spoke loud. God was quiet, but God was unmistakable. God doesn't shout. God doesn't shout at us. Sometimes I think we want God to shout, but I think 
If God were to ever shout, we would just be like, oh no. God doesn't shout, but when God speaks, it's unmistakable. It leaves you with the feeling of this is absolutely what I am to do. I know I have heard from God. God is quiet, but God is loud. God speaks quietly, but loudly, quietly, but unmistakably. The second thing that's true is that God speaks firmly, but gently. He is firm, but gentle. He is authoritative without being bossy and imposing. I know, I, I know you're afraid, but I'm telling you to go. He acknowledges and understands our fear and our weakness and our struggle, but still calls and challenges us to go forward into the future that he has for us. Not calls us, commands us, instructs us, pushes us out, pushes us beyond our comfort zone while understanding where our comfort zone is. He is firm. He is in command. He is authoritative, but he's also gentle and compassionate and understanding at the same time. He is firm and gentle. At the same time, he's also timely, but patient. Something that I'm learning as, as a dad and still learning as a husband is to make sure I'm giving my girls time to be themselves and have their fun while also knowing we want to be on time to the things and the places that we're going. I am learning to account for their personalities that aren't my own, tempo that isn't my own, moodiness that isn't my own. And I'm understanding to awaken my girls and start the process of moving in a timely manner that accounts for who they are and how much time they will need to process and work toward whatever is happening. For Marvel, it's she's got to have some time to snuggle. She's got to have some time to snuggle before we get her dressed. And she wants to have that, that, that snuggle and cuddle time with daddy. For Noble, she wants some time to kind of run around and get a little bit of energy out. I'm learning that I need to make sure that they are awake in time to do that so that we can leave on time for where we need to go. I've also learned, talking about timing, not to talk too far into the future where it could cause confusion for our girls. In other words, we don't talk about the second and third thing on the calendar until we've been through the next thing on the calendar. We don't talk to the girls about what they want for their birthday if Christmas hasn't happened yet. And the reason I bring that up is to bring a parallel to what God does as our Heavenly Father. As our Heavenly Father, as a good Heavenly Father, He speaks what we need to hear when we need to hear it. He draws draws our attention to it. He wakes us up from our slumber when we need to hear it. And he's patient with us as we figure out the doing of what we have heard from him. He, spe he speaks up and grabs our attention and wakes us up from our slumber in time for us to move in the direction that he wants us to go so that we can get there in time that he wants us to get there. Chances are, in other words, chances are God won't be speaking to you about your life in your 80s when you're still in your 20s or maybe your 30s or your 40s. God will speak to us about what's happening next in front of us. He doesn't talk about the second, the third, or the fourth, or the fifth thing. He talks to us about what's happening next. And the final thing that's true about God is that God is God-centered and you-focused. God is God-centered and you focus. He's concerned with his glory and your good at the same time. God is concerned with his glory. He is centered on himself, which makes him sound self-centered. And that's a good thing when you're God. When you're God, you get to be self-centered. He wants his glory and he wants your good at the same time. He's concerned with what will bring him honor and acclaim while protecting and preserving you and your life and your future. Meaning God doesn't risk your future or your family or your life for the sake of his glory and his honor. He may call you to take your eyes off of the immediate for a stretch of time. What you think will bring you, the, you, you your good, th good for you and your future. He'll take your eyes off of your immediate for a few moments occasionally, but he'll never call you to risk your long-term good. He wants his glory and your good at the same time. And we think those two things can't happen, but when it's in God's hands, it can absolutely happen. God speaks to us in firm but gentle ways. He's timely, but he's patient. He's quiet, but he's loud. And he's God-centered and you focused all at the same time. And those are some incredible things to know about God and the incredible things that are true about who God is and how he leads and how he speaks to us and how he communicates with us. When God speaks, chances are it will sound an awful lot like all of that. It'll be firm, but it'll be gentle. It'll be quiet, but it will be loud. It'll be timely, but he'll also be patient. And it'll be focused on his glory, and it'll also be focused on your good at the same time. When God leads in a new direction, chances are it'll feel an awful lot like all of that.
And yet at the same time, that still leads us to a question. As we're trying to figure out what God might be speaking to us, when the moments where we feel like, okay, I feel like God might be speaking. I feel like he might be leading a new direction. I feel like he might be calling us out of this and towards something new. But I'm not sure. How do we f- figure out and move with confidence when we're trying to figure out those questions? And when we're trying to figure out those, that, that, the answer to that question, I actually want to give us five new questions, five questions, five questions that when we were trying to figure out, are we supposed to go plant a church? And if so, how? And if so, and if so, when? As we were trying to figure those out, these were some of the questions that really drove us and drove our thinking as we began to try to work toward our future and figure out our future. These were some of the questions that drove us when we were trying to figure out, well, when should we have ch- children? When should we try to ra- you know, to start a family? When, you know, when, when it was moving, to, for me, when it was moving to New Mexico from, from, from the Midwest where I grew up, how do, you, how do you figure out that? How do you answer those questions? Is God really in this? Is this what God really wants me to do? For, for these five for these five questions, I'm going to just go, and I can go one at a time and give a little bit of scripture and talk a little bit about what this looks like for us to ask this question and, and, and what will happen as we ask this question. The first question is simply this. Does what I feel God speaking to me line up with scripture? Does what I feel God speaking to me line up with scripture? 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says this, all scripture is God God breathed and is useful and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In other words, the word of God is what equips us for every good work, but it also equips us to figure out the answer to the question, is this what God was really speaking to me? It gives us the answer because, because God will never con- contradict what he has already spoken. God will never contradict what he has already spoken. He will never ask you to do something now that conflicts with what he has already told you to do in his word. God sp- on, on top of that, God's spoken word, what he speaks to us, what he reveals to us, what he shows to us, what he, that when he points in a new direction, God's spoken word will typically align with his written word. It will align with his written word. So here's the thing. If you feel like God is saying, hey, the reason that you haven't moved forward is because you've never forgiven them. That lines up with what God says in his word about forgiveness, about setting, setting us free and allowing us to experience and know the forgiveness of God in our own life. That, that, that lines up, that God would be speaking to you about forgiveness, that that's a step that you need to take and he'll show you who you need to forgive and how you need to forgive. And it lines up with what is in his word. At the same time, if you feel like God is saying, hey, I know our marriage is rough right now, you should probably just take a break from marriage and each other you are probably not hearing from God. That's probably coming from you. That's coming from culture. That's coming from the voice of a friend who doesn't know what they're talking about. Because according to scripture, taking a break from responsibility doesn't ever solve a problem. Does this make sense? God will never, God, God will never speak to you in a way that contradicts and conflicts with what he has already revealed to you through his word and through scripture. That God's spoken word, what he speaks to us today, will always line up with what he has revealed to us in his written word of of scripture. The second question is simply this. Does what I feel God speaking to me align with God's purposes for my life? Does what I feel God speaking to me right now, does that align with God's larger purposes for my life? In Romans chapter 8, verses 27 and 28, we, we read this. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance, in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. That God not only has a plans for your life, but God has a purpose for every life. That God has purposes that he created every single one of us to live out and to experience. Each of us was created for fellowship in the body of Christ. We were created to grow in the way that we know and follow God. We were created to spread the, go- the gospel good news of Jesus to any and all who don't know him. We were created to use my gifts and talents to serve God and to serve others. And you were created to honor God with our moments of worship and with our lives. This is what's called the general will of God. Things that each and every one of us are called to that are part of God's plan for every single life. In other words, God will never tell us to be self-focused with our gifts 
and our talents. He always wants us to use our gifts and our talents for the good and for the benefit of someone else. God will never tell you not to share the gospel, good news, with people that you have influence with. God will never tell you to live in a way that doesn't honor him. If there's a way that doesn't honor God, God is not ever going like, that's what you need to do. God will never tell you to abandon the process of knowing him and becoming like him. Someone's going like, yeah, I feel like God really told me to t- take a break from reading the Bible. No, he did not. God really told me to take a break from ser- trying, to, trying to serve others. No, he did not. God will never tell us to, t- to abandon the process of knowing him and becoming like him. God will never tell you to abandon godly community. Now, again, there are unhealthy communities out there. There are times where a community becomes unhealthy. Like, I, I get that. But God will never tell you to abandon healthy, godly community. Can I be honest and tell you where, where we wrestled a little bit with God in prayer before, before planting Movement Church was that last one. We, we were part of a great church and a great staff and had people we knew and loved and cared for and really genuinely good friends in Alamogordo as part of the church there. We felt like God was calling us to do was taking, taking a step away from community and away from fellowship. And the way that we eventually came to like understand it was that God wasn't was yes in fact calling us away from that community. God was calling us away from that one, but He was also calling us to build a new one, not just for us, but for a whole lot of people here in Las Cruces. God doesn't ever tell us to move away or to work against the larger purposes, the general purposes that we were all created for. In His specific will, He will never have us work against His general. Will so, so so does what I feel like God's telling me in align with God's larger purposes for my life? The third question is this, what do wise people think of what I feel God might be speaking to me? In Hebrews chapter 13, verses 7 and, and 17, it says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you. They keep watch over. They are watching out for your life as those who must give an account that good leaders, that good small group leaders, that good pastors, that good spiritual leaders, good spiritual authority, we watch over a life as if we actually have to give an account for how we led that life. That we, so we want to pay attention. What, what do wise people like? When I feel like God might be saying something to me, when I think God might be speaking to me, when I think God might be leading me in a new direction, when God might be leading me to start something new or telling me to break off something that I really don't want to break off, but I feel like it might just be a God thing. I don't just keep that to myself. I actually talk to people who have experience in working through things, who are wiser than me, who are further down the road than me, who have some, who have a, a spiritual authority over me in some sense. I want to pay attention and not just keep it to myself and try to figure it out by myself, but I want to ask the question of people who I know love for me and care about my life. We want to ask, talk to those who have walked ahead of us in faith and those who have walked ahead of us in marriage, in parenting, in, in, the, in a, maybe a potential course of study in our in finances, in career, those who have done what I hope to do one day and have done it well, what do they think of what I'm potentially hearing and feeling from God? People who are dating, like to talk to people who are dating or single. We have this tendency to talk to a lot of other people who are dating and try to emulate other dating couples. Nothing necessarily wrong with that, but you also need to spend time around healthy and married couples who dated well and built a solid foundation for marriage while they were dating and ask them your big questions. And when you're wondering like, hey, is this something that I should be paying more attention to? You know, don't do this like couple and couple, do this with guys and guys and girls who are like, hey, this is something I'm wondering if this is a big deal. Is this a big deal? Is this something that I should actually pay attention to? Is this something I should bring up? Is this a reason to break off a relationship? Is this a reason to move forward in a relationship? Like we want to ask our big questions to people who have gotten it right and done it well. People considering a career change. It's great to ask people doing what you're thinking about doing and get some feedback and ideas on taking the next steps that you are considering. And a follow-up to this is not just to say, I want to talk to wise people, but I want to talk to spiritual leaders. I want to ask the spiritual leaders in my life, like, do they think this seems like something that God might be in? Do they think this seems like that, or like, like something that God would be moving me towards? Like, like I, 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 as a pastor, can I just say, like, there are times that as a pastor, I have been absolutely and genuinely shocked when someone tells me, yeah, we're doing this because God told me. And I'm like, 
I had no idea. Like you've already, you've already decided. Like you, you didn't even talk to me. And here's the thing: I don't want to be in every single conversation about everybody's life and everything like that. But when someone's making making a large, large, large life changing move, I, I I do find it a little silly that sometimes people don't even think to ask and talk to their pastor and see if this seems like a good idea. It's a, always a great throughout my life. Every time I've made some big major decision. And I, I don't, again, I don't bring this up because I, because this is something that I necessarily like want everyone to talk to me about everything. But every time I have had a major life decision, I have, I have gone to a spiritual authority. I've gone to a small group leader, gone to my pastors and just said, does this seem like the type of thing that God might be speaking to me? And could we have a conversation about it? I just think there is wisdom in that, in, in talking to wiser people, in talking to spiritual authority to say, hey, look, does this seem like something that God might be saying to me? But here's a follow-up to that. If you know God is absolutely speaking to you, it doesn't matter what anyone has to say or think about it. You follow obediently. You don't allow the fear of man to stop you from something that you know God is speaking to you. When you're not sure and when you need confirmation one way or another, these are great people to go to and to ask. The fourth question is this. What is the cost of following what I feel like God is, is, is telling me. Luke chapter 14, Jesus said this, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost or other translations, count the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. See, there's two things. When you count the cost, when you understand the cost, when you have looked ahead and thought through what might the cost of doing of following God, what might I what might I have to lay down, what might I have to give up, what might what relationships might take a hit when you do that, you can you can do two things. The first thing is this, when you count the cost, you can plan well. When you count the cost, you can plan well. You can budget accordingly. You can make other life, major life decisions accordingly. I am a huge advocate. If you've been part of our church for a while, you've heard me talk about this. I am a huge advocate of not making an overwhelming amount of major life changes in a certain time frame. Not everyone is, but if you think that way, let's say, for example, you're considering a major career transition and want to start a family or have another child. It may be that you have to make a decision of which one to prioritize. Well, we're going to wait to have a child because we feel like this is absolutely the right timing. This is God's timing for us to make this change and we can have a child later. Or we feel like God wants us to start a family now and we can wait on the career change for a little bit. The timing may be right for one, but not for the other. And when you are aware of the cost, when you've counted the cost, you can plan well, the second thing it lets you do is when you count the cost ahead of time, you're not surprised when it happens because here's what happens. Some of us, when we don't count the cost, we end up surprised at what happens as a result of us following God. And when we hit those some of, some of those bumps in the road and some of those surprises and some of those whoops, I did not expect that. I didn't see that coming. We think that I didn't see it coming means that God somehow, that we're doing it wrong. That this isn't, was, what, it wasn't what we were supposed to do. But when you count the cost ahead of time, you're not surprised when it happens. You're not surprised when someone doesn't understand what you're doing. When, when someone hasn't heard from God on your behalf, that they don't understand what you're doing, why you're making the changes that you're making, why you're making the sacrifices that you're making. When someone doesn't understand, you're not surprised by it. You're not surprised when it takes longer than you thought. You're not surprised when finances aren't the same. You're not surprised when it's more difficult. You're not surprised when everyone doesn't agree with you and buy in right away. Like you're not surprised because you have counted the cost. You figured out ahead of time that everyone was not going to understand. You figured out ahead of time that finances might not be the same for a while. You figured out ahead of time that it might just take longer than you thought, that it wasn't all going to be easy along the way. You're not surprised. And when you're not, and because you're not surprised, you're less likely to give up and pack it up and head on home. And then the fifth and final question is simply this, does what I feel God leading me toward build the church? Does it build the church? Does it build the family of God? See, God passionately cares about his church. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 through 27, we're told this, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Now, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. But then it says this, that Jesus loves the church and he gave himself up for her. 
That's what Jesus did because of his love for the church. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. God cares about whether or not our lives are building the thing that Jesus died for. The thing that Jesus died for is the church. And as we're trying to figure out like what I, what I do with my time and my energy and my finances and my resources and my leadership and my friendships and all of that, at the end of the day, I think we have to at least ask the question, is what I think I hear from God, like the direction that God has me moving in, the thing that I'm, the, the changes that I'm considering making, does it help build the church that Jesus died for? So with my time, does it, like what I'm thinking about doing with my time, does it help build the church that Jesus died for? With my energy, does it help build the, the church that Jesus died for? With my finances, with what I do with my finances and the changes that I'm considering making with my financial future, what does it do to the church that God that Jesus died for? And with my friendships and my, and my, and, and my resources and, my, and the, the, the time that I can invest into people, does it help to build the church that Jesus died for? In other words, I want to give the best of what I got to build the thing that Jesus died for. And if I'm feeling, if what I'm feeling doesn't build that, I'm out. Like if 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 what I'm considering doesn't build the church that Jesus died for, I'm out. And if what I'm feeling led to do, I feel confident that God is speaking, but I don't know how it builds the church. That's something I need clarity on before I proceed. That like, like, like I, I'm like, okay, I, God, you're speaking about this, but I don't know how it builds the church. So before we move forward, I want, to, I want, I want you to show me and, and, and help me understand how this is supposed to build your church. So five questions. Let me just re- recap them again here, give them to you all at once. Number one, does what I feel God speaking to me line up with Scripture? God will never contradict in, 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 your, in His spoken word what He has revealed to you in His written word. Number two, does what I feel God speaking to me align with God's purposes for my life, God's general will? Does God's specific will will not conflict with His general will. What do wise people think of what I feel God might be speaking to me? Those who have gone before me, those who are wiser than me, those who have known Jesus longer than me. What do they think when I tell them what I feel like God is speaking to me? And number four, what is the cost of what I feel God is telling me? When you know that, you can plan well and you can be prepared so that you're not surprised and head home. And number five, does what I feel God calling me toward build the church that Jesus died for? If you're trying to figure out, you know, I, like I believe God has a plan for my life and I do not want to miss it, but I also want to make sure I'm actually hearing from God. I want to make sure that I that that I'm in line that what I think I'm hearing, what I think I'm feeling, the direction I think God is moving me. I want to make sure that that's actually in line with God. I w- I don't want to take a step without him. I don't want to make a move without him. I don't want to say a word without him. I want to do what he would have me to do. I want to go where he would have me to go. I want to say what I what he would have me to say. These are five questions that will help you gain incredible clarity as you listen for the voice of God that's quiet but loud, as you listen for the voice of God that's firm but gentle, as you listen for the voice of God that's focused on His glory and your good, as you focus on the voice of God, as you try to hear the voice of God that is timely but will also be patient with you. These are five questions that will help you gain incredible clarity as you hear the voice of God because God has a plan for your life and you don't want to miss it. And God has a plan for your life. And you want to make sure that you've heard from God what that plan is. And as you do that, you can walk in confidence. And you can walk with a clarity knowing that God is with you, that God is for you, and that God is working in the details of what he is working out in your life. And when you do that, you can walk in confidence and peace and joy with a hope-filled confidence in what God might do in your future because you're walking out the plans that God has for you that you do not want to miss. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your grace for us. Thank you for your mercy for us. Thank you that you have a plan for our lives. And thank you that it's so good and so great and so big and so wide that we really don't want to miss it. God, I pray today 
that what we've just heard and that what we've just read together in the scripture that we've just read and the teaching we've just received, God, that this would be something that would bring us clarity as we attempt to hear from you and follow your leadership and figure out what is the plan that you have for our lives. God, we know that the, the general things that you have for our lives, God, as we figure out maybe the specific steps that you want each of us to take, help us to figure that out. Help us to listen well to, the, your, to your voice. Thank you that you speak to us in many different ways. God, help us to figure out, as, as you speak to us in many different ways, help us to have clarity and help us to use these filters to bring us clarity and confidence so that we can walk with you, we can walk according to what you want us to do, and we can follow you with everything we've got. Help us to do that in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I know.
see the scars of love upon his hands. The king is in the room. We'll watch the darkness flee at his command. Who is this king? Who is this
Well, it's been a great day together it's online, studying the Word of God together, worshiping together. Hopefully you found it encouraging and challenging and hope-filled, and hopefully you're able to take some step closer to Jesus because of your time with us today. We wanted to let you know a few ways that you could engage with our church beyond this Sunday experience. I want to let you know, first of all, the ways that you can give. If you want to give today, we want to say thank you so much for your generosity. The ways that you can give are listed on screen right now, whether it's online on our website, uh, through a cash app, through text message, or through sending a physical offering to our PO box. But however and whenever you give, we really do want to say thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your faithfulness to God. Thank you for your obedience to God's word. Thank you for your generosity to our church that keeps us funded, fully funded, and able to do whatever God has called us and asked us to do um, in the future and here and now in Las Cruces. So thank you so much for being willing to be a giver and being generous towards God's church. Um, we also want to let you know if you have a need, we would love to hear from you so we know how we can pray for you, so we know how we can pastor you, so we know how we can be a part of meeting your need. And so if you have a need right now, the ways that you can let us know are on screen right now, whether it's by phone, by text, by email, or by Facebook, we would love to hear from you so we know how we can meet or be a part of praying for your need need. And then the last thing we wanted to remind you of is if you have kids in elementary or preschool, our kids' experiences go live every Sunday at 10 a.m. on Facebook and YouTube, and they're incredible ways to keep your kids engaged and growing in their faith. Well, that's all we've got for you today on this Sunday. Look forward to seeing you next week for part three of My Will, Thy Will. And until then, keep being the movement.